again, everyone. This is Michelle Ross. Welcome to Managing Stress and Conflict. I thank you for being here promptly at 7 o'clock. I'm going to give it about another minute. I do see some more people trying to log into the webinar. So if you bear with me, we'll get started in one minute. Thank you. Hello, hello. Welcome to our Managing Stress and Conflict webinar. My name is Lachelle Janey Ross, and I'm happy for all of you to join us, and we are about to get started. I first want to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we are currently recording this session, um, and everybody's mic is muted right now just to keep down the feedback from the noises and so many people on here. But I really want you to participate in this webinar and ask questions and be a part of it. So I do ask that if you have questions, please feel free to um, type in a message into the chat and we will pause to answer your questions because it's very important for you to participate in this. In order to ask a question, just use the emoticon to raise your hand or add a smiley face. You can type a message into the chat log. Um, and let's just test this now. And I'm going to ask either that you type up a message, raise your hand, or send me a emoticon and let me know that you can hear me. So can everybody do that, please, if you can hear me? Awesome, awesome. I'm glad that we can hear me. Awesome. OK, well, let's get started. Today we are talking about managing stress and conflict. I want to start off by taking you on a journey, since this is Girl Scouts, we love journey. While I'm t telling you about this journey, I want you to look at the picture on the screen, and I want to imagine that you are the glass of water that's on the screen, and the water in the glass represents the activities that are going along on this journey. Okay, let's begin. It's Monday morning. You've got everybody out of the house and you're on your way taking your children to school. Your oldest daughter on the way to get, or she's getting out the car, stops and says, hey, Ma, I forgot to tell you, we have a Girl Scout meeting today that was rescheduled for 5.30. Oh, and by the way, I left my uniform at home. Okay, so you can see that you already have, looking at the glass of water, this is you, you already have your day planned out full of activities because you are a working parent, and then your daughter is pouring on some more activities, which is represented by the water in the glass. These are your thoughts. Okay, I get off at 4.30. I'll just take a long lunch to run home and get my daughter's uniform, and then I'll grab some snacks on the way to the meeting after I pick up the kids. Not a big deal. You get to work, and this is when life happens. Uh-oh, I just found out we have a team meeting today. How come my manager didn't give any advance notice? And then the meeting's at 12 o'clock, which is my lunchtime, and I plan on running home. Great. This really changes things. Okay. I could still make this work. I'll just have to leave work at 3.30 and take an hour of my leave time. Then I can have time to run home and get some snacks in a uniform. Uh-oh, come on now. My manager just told me that they need a report completed by the end of the day that she just now is telling me about. And I still have to attend the meeting at noon. Uh-oh, this is not going to end up the way I planned it. Now, if you look at the water in the cup now, you can see that it's starting to overflow. And the lemon is another negative thing that's thrown on top of your planned activities. These are your thoughts. Oh, my goodness, they must think that people don't have a life outside of this job. Management's procrastination shouldn't be my emergency. Well, you know what? I'm still going to leave at 3.30 no matter what. I have things to do. This is the reality of what happened during the day. My meeting didn't end until 1.30, and I didn't even get a lunch. I had a customer come in unannounced, of course, demanding to speak with me at 3. So I still had to see them. Then on top of it, I had to get that report completed, no excuses, so I didn't leave work until 
as you can see now, a lot of tension and stress is built up, and so the cup is overflowing. Does this look familiar to anyone? I am. Um, I would like for y'all to respond to that. Please type yes. Is this a typical day? These um, actual things might not have happened, but does this look familiar for a typical day of stress? Yes, awesome. I know for me, this is a very realistic thing. I have small children. I'm in elementary and middle school. I work full time. And a lot of times, this things like this do happen. And so this was just to give you an idea and make you really think about stressors and things in your life and conflict and how it arises in this scenario. It was some conflict with the job because you were not informed of things that you were required to do, which caused a conflict, and tension, and stress. Yes, I see some people are saying that they have four kids here. So yes, I can imagine that you come into all sorts of circumstances. And then a lot of times on top of that, we're helping with other people's kids, especially as troop leaders and troops. And it's a lot of different scenarios. So thank you so much for sharing. What we're gonna look at for the next few minutes is how to fix these situations that all happen way too often in our daily lives. First, I'm gonna identify what stress is according to the, Mer the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. It's defined as an adaptive response to an external situation that re results in physical, psychological, and or behavioral deviations from organizational, organizational participants. It's the body's response to environmental situations. And in layman's terms, it's basically saying stress is a feeling of emotion or physical tension. It can come from any event or thought that makes you feel frustrated, angry, or nervous. Stress is your body's reaction to a challenge or demand. Stress can also be positive, and it can be experienced when we, someone is focused on a specific task, motivated, feeling confident, and excited about what he or she is hoping to achieve. It's a short-term feeling when it's positive stress, and some examples of these would be wedding, holidays, or pregnancy. What is conflict? Conflict is defined as a serious disagreement or argument, typically a protracted one. Conflict is simply a struggle or opposition. Does anybody have any questions about what conflict and stress is before we go any further? Okay, awesome. I'm going to keep moving right along. Conflict can also be positive, um, and it becomes a positive thing when people consider different ideas and alternatives, and it results in increased participation and commitment to the decisions and goals of a group. Results in the issue of clarification and reassessment, and it also builds a cohesiveness or team building as people learn more about each other and how they operate. So I'm going to bring to your attention some of the ways that stress and conflict affect our body. Um, stress makes the hormones, um, I'm sorry, the stress, when stress builds up in your body, it affects your hormones, which also affects your respiratory, your cardiovascular system, which is definitely unhealthy. A lot of times when you're really stressed, you can develop asthma and breathing problems and also heart disease. During the stress response, your body often breathes a lot faster, which makes the blood flow through your body and your brain differently, and it also raises your blood pressure. Frequent chronic stress or having stress all the time will also make your heart work extra hard, which can sometimes lead to a heart attack. Stress also increases the, the amount of a hormone in your body called cortisol, which causes you to eat even when you're not hungry, and this leads to obesity and other unhealthy aspects of your body. Stress can cause pain, tightness or soreness in your muscles, and also muscle spasms that, that cause a lot of pain. And it also weakens your body's immune system. When you're stressed a lot, you have a tendency to pick up colds or flus. And if you already have an autoimmune disease, it makes a lot of your symptoms worse. So what I'm going to do now is tell you some of the ways to deal with stress. There are five major coping strategies of stress. Those include pent-up emotions, releasing them, distracting yourself, managing hostile feelings, meditation, and relaxation procedures. I'm going to put up a brief poll, and I'm going to ask everyone, please take a moment to answer what um, type of strategy you use the most when you're dealing with stress. And I'll give everybody a minute to do that now. 
You can find it right in the chat log. Looking at the polls and the results of the poll, most people use systematic relaxation techniques, and that is one of the best ways to relieve stress. Awesome. I see some people also find ways just to release the pin up the motions and distractions and meditation. There are various ways, and all of them are effective, and we're going to talk about um, a few of the top ways to, that you can do on a regular so when you um, come in contact with the stress and conflict, you know the best thing to do. Cope or manage? Let me ask you a question. When it comes to stress, would you rather be proactive or reactive? You take a minute to answer that, please. Okay, do we want to be proactive or reactive when it comes to stress? Okay, I see everybody saying proactive. Awesome. So the main difference between coping and managing is when you're coping with the stress, you're being reactive. But when you manage your stress, it makes you proactive. And one of the best ways to do that is to plan ahead. When you plan ahead, it puts you at a different position. It allows you to perform tasks or meet objectives before they become urgent. Because once they get to that urgent level, that's when it becomes a stressor. St excuse me, stressor. When you plan ahead, it allows you to respond appropriately to different situations in which you have a more calming outcome, and that also prevents the stress. When you plan ahead, you're better organized, so even when you get those unexpected things and things fall apart, you can handle them calmly and stay in a nice, cool, meditative state. Planning ahead creates self-discipline, and it creates more order in your personal and professional lives. And by doing so, it allows you to constantly stick to your values and make the right decisions, which increases the success in all areas of your life. Planning ahead also decreases procrastination, which a lot of people, including myself, do. If you plan ahead of the time, you're more apt to complete the activities instead of putting them off for things to do tomorrow. And also planning ahead ensures preparation. When you plan in advance, you know what tools and materials are necessary to complete the task, and you have the time to make sure that you have those tools and resources so you can be successful. Examples of planning ahead. Um, there's things that we do daily, and um, they're very simple. You really don't have to make changes in your schedule, um, but some things you could do is prepare for tomorrow, the evening before. For instance, when you pick out your clothing or your children's clothing, take a few minutes to do it at night so you don't have to worry about doing it at 6.15 in the morning when you got to be out the door at 7 with your two or three kids. Um, write down appointment times. Um, everybody has a phone these days, so you don't have to take pen and paper. Or if you prefer to do that, you can take pen and paper, but put them in your cell phone, set reminders. We all have good intent to want to remember all of our daily routines and daily appointments. However, writing them down makes it better and also gives us a little reminder when things are out of the norm so that way we don't forget anything. Practice preventative maintenance. Um, a good example of this is that for anyone that has a car, you know, if you take care of your car, your car will take care of you. If you go get your oil changed every 3,000 miles, get your maintenance things done, um, check your tire pressure stuff, you're less apt to have any accidents or emergencies. So just take, things, take care of things in advance so that will avoid old emergencies which cause stress. And then another thing is avoid constant aggravation. A lot of times, especially me as a mom, we put ourselves on the back burner and it's the little things that can make ourselves and make our day go easier that we don't take care of right away. A good example of this would be a broken alarm clock. Um, it might not be all the way broke, but it doesn't work the way it should. The time might run slow at night so you don't get it fixed and then you always wake up 10 minutes late. Go ahead and purchase that new alarm clock so that way you can get up on time and your day starts off on a good note and you don't have to worry about that stress. And last but not least, Try to always have contingency plans. Have a just in case. Of course, with every situation, you're not going to have that, but as much as possible, have the backup plan. If you know that you work and you do long hours and um, 
if your child gets sick and your husband or spouse or significant other, what have you, is not available, maybe a neighbor could pick up a child from school. But try to have, again, that backup plan and that relieves some of the stressors. Any questions so far about planning ahead? Or would anybody like to share some of the things and techniques that they do planning ahead? Okay. I see one person puts, they mark everything on their calendar. Awesome. Awesome. That way you don't have to rely on your memory. <laughs> hey, we'll keep moving right along. Another person puts that they use their calendar also. Actually, so I'm so glad we have smartphones right now. It makes life so much easier. Another great tool to relieve stress or manage your stress of daily life is have a support system. We have to face reality, stress is going to occur, but the way you handle it is by having a great support system in place. Um, when you have demands placed on you at work, school, within your relationships, community, whatever, that exceed your ability to cope, it causes stress and it raises tension in your body. Sometimes stress can be beneficial as we talked about before. However, when it's not beneficial, it causes extreme health consequences. So you need to know your limits and have a plan. And that's where your support system comes in. First of all, for your support system, we need to take time to recognize the fact that you need help. We are not superwomen and supermen. At some point, you're going to need help with something in your life. It's okay. I know for me, I have a lot of pride. <laughs> and I'm always, oh, I don't want to ask anybody how I'll figure it out myself. But that can be detrimental and unhealthy. It's okay to ask for help. Man by nature is a community being, and we are designed to fellowship and be in fellowship with others, but we need to ask for help. So step number one, recognize that you need help. Step number two, don't be afraid to ask for the help. It's always somebody out there that you can trust is willing to help you. I know me, when I had, um, my girls were younger, I didn't want them to stay with anybody that was not me or my mommy. Um, but as they got older, you know, I had to learn to let go. Um, what you want to do is form a list of people that can help you. It could be your family members, neighbors, coworkers, church members, community, anybody that you know and trust around you or your children or whatever you need the assistance with. Because it doesn't always have to be somebody helping with your kids. It could just be help as far as um, if you're taking on a responsibility in the community and let's say, um, and I'll use Girl Scout leader. You have a Girl Scout meeting one day and you and your co-leader are both unavailable at the same time, you should have some parents that are willing to follow through with the girls to make sure that the plan still can be carried out. Um, so just have a buy-in of people that can assist you and help you to meet your support system. So make that list of people you want to include, and then always periodically go back to that list and revise it. Sometimes people that you think will be your help might not be the best people to be on your list. And then you'll also find as you're going through your day-to-day -day activities, you'll meet people that you didn't have on your list that need to be included. And remember, it, again, it's a support system. You cannot do it alone. But when you work together, it will lead to you having a healthier life and you'll be able to handle and manage your stress much better. Does anybody have any questions about support system? Okay. Just remember to continue to update your list and check on the regular. Okay. The third way that you could do all the time, no matter where you are, is smile. No matter what situation you're in, just by smiling always releases a little bit of the tension and lightens the load a little bit. Smiling is the simple and one of the most effective ways to bring down your stress and your hormones in your body right away. When you smile on a daily basis, your brain actually creates what they call happiness loops, so you'll naturally think more positively with all the stuff you do throughout the day. Also, medical studies have shown that smiling releases endorphins, which are natural painkillers that also out of that counteract stress, and it can lift your mood and lower your stress. So I encourage you, even if you're going through something, even going back to the little story I was telling, where your supervisor irritated you, you get one thing thrown on you on top of the other, Take a few minutes to smile. It doesn't resolve the situation, but it'll let you debrief for the next for five or six seconds, and it does release those endorphins, which helps to get your mood back up and keep things in a more calming sense. 
And just out of curiosity, I'm going to put another poll out there um, that I can get everybody to answer. Um, if you would go to your polls, please. How many times a day do you have a crazy day similar to the one that I talked about um, where stuff is just being piled on one over top of another? I know for me, it happens probably three to four times a week just because it's life. <laughs> so if you take a few minutes to answer the poll, that would be awesome. Okay, so I see that a lot of people are experiencing chaotic days or or we won't even call them chaotic because we're learning how to manage that chaos now or stress, um, but they experience unplanned or um, surprise days several times a week. So I'm very happy that we're on here looking at ways that we can deal with this in a positive way. Some other ways is to manage stress on a daily basis is to think about everything we do daily. Um, learn to avoid three things, caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. Again, stress does release hormones in your body, and alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine all work against those hormones, hormones which makes those levels intensify instead of detensify. Um, for me, I'm an avid Coca-Cola drinker, which I've learned to replace with um, unsweetened and decaffeinated tea, which helps a lot. Um, so just where you can make little changes to help make yourself healthier. So again, you want to avoid the alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine as much as possible. Indulge in a physical activity. Um, when you get your body moving, you always feel better, um, even if it's just a walk. Um, I'm not saying if you're not a person that does a lot of physical activity, I'm not saying run out and start doing a marathon, 5K marathon, but every little step helps. Um, if you walk to the end of your street one day, then tomorrow go to the next lot and just keep adding on or if you don't like to walk if you have an exercise bike skating um even since we've been in the house i know one thing i do with my daughters we dance a lot in the house we make little silly tiktok videos um and dancing is a form of exercise and it works up your heart rate and stuff so just remember to move and do some physical activity um another thing you want to do is get proper rest i know that you hear all the time about getting eight to ten hours of sleep Studies have shown when you do not get proper rest, it takes years off of your life. Please, 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 as much as possible, get proper rest. And it's important to get a proper chunk of rest. It does not affect your body the same way if you sleep two hours here, four hours there. You want to try to sleep in an eight-hour period to give your body a chance to unwind. Think of your body and your brain as the human computer. Well, when we leave work, we turn our computers off. We give our computers a chance to rest. So you want to do the same thing with your mind. Just let your mind rest and rejuvenate. Um, try relaxation techniques, which some of you already said that you were doing, which always works to help manage stuff. Talk to people. Um, there's plenty of times. Um, I even had an instance today where I didn't agree with something that was going on, and I had to call one of my friends and say, hey, I just need to vent. I don't need you to fix it. I just need to vent. And once I got it out in the open, I felt better. Um, if you have, if you like to write, keep a stress diary. And when you keep that stress diary, not only are you writing down things that trigger the stress factor, write, you'll notice a pattern when you go back and look at your diary of things that cause it. And that, in turn, will help you stay away from those stressors or at least be aware so you know how to manage your responses so it's positive. And if you're not a writer, they have all kind of apps on the phone where you could do a, a voice recorder and you can make a voice or a speaking diary as well. And as much as possible, take control of your life. And when I say take control of life, it gets back to the, the first thing we talked about, planning ahead, having a support system, and working together. You also want to manage your time, and again, that comes under planning ahead. Of course, there's certain things at your job that you might not can manage. There's certain things that's going to happen outside of your job, but as much as you can, manage your time and make sure you incorporate time for you. Even if it's just a half hour or 15 minutes, you have to do something for yourself every day because you're no good to anyone else if you're not taking care of yourself. And my favorite thing to manage stress is learn to say no. No is a complete sentence. You don't have to give an excuse. You don't have to make things up and learn to say no. I know um, I have a sister who loves to help everybody, and she will help people and overextend herself to her whole detriment. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't help people because, of course, you want to help people as much as possible, but you can't do it to your own detriment. And for those of you who are the same way, 
if you can't say no, you know, and you might feel a little relu reluctant just to say a no to a request, practice saying things like, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't commit to this right now because I have other priorities, or now is not a good time because I'm in the middle of something. Why don't you ask me again at a later date? Or I love to do this, but, and it's okay. Um, I'm laughing because somebody put on here saying, no, it's hard to the Girl Scouts. Yes, it is. I often tell the story. I started as a troop leader with my daughter's troops. I just wanted to be the parent to sit in the corner, read a book, and mind my business for an hour and a half each week. But I ended up being a troop leader. I ended up being in a service unit. And now I actually work for Girl Scouts. And I tell all the time, I was voluntold to do all these things. I didn't volunteer. I was voluntold. But you still have to keep a balance and just learn to say no. Um, I see some other people started in the corner too, so it's okay. I'm glad that, and I, please don't say no right now. We need you here, Girl Scouts, as our troop leaders and our active bomb, the parent volunteers. Um, but still, please take time for yourself. It's very important because when you do that, you're refreshing, renewed, and you be a renewed, refreshed person for the girls as well. Ways to manage conflict. All the things that we talked about works very well for stress and conflict. However, I did want to point out something that is very, very important to me when you're dealing with conflict. You have to be able to have a dialogue with the person that you're in conflict with. I always suggest to people, if you're in the middle of conflict, having that dialogue might not be the exact moment to do it, but at some point after a cool down period, you have to have a dialogue. And when you have that dialogue, it is very, very, very important that both people in the dialogue are active listeners. It's not a thing where people are just talking to each other to tell their side of the story, but you have to be an active listener. And when you are communicating with the person, don't focus on so much on what irritated you to cause the conflict, or you might not like how a person dresses or smells or what they eat, or you might not like um, friends in common that people have or how they socialize or whatever. All those things are irrelevant. The main thing that you want to address is the actual point of confrontation, and you want to listen to both sides. When both of you, and sometimes you need a third person there just to make sure you focus on only the subject matter and you don't go off on the other tangents. So um, you could get a mediator or someone that's willing to mediate so that way it stays on neutral ground. And again, I cannot reiterate enough, please be a good listener. I see somebody put on their active listening in conflict. It's very hard. And if it is a very intense form of conflict, I definitely recommend take some moment to cool down. Even if you don't walk away for an hour or days or whatever, at least take a few minutes where both parties can just turn around, breathe, maybe do some breathing exercises, and then come back where you're at the point where both of you can listen. It is very important that you identify the points of the agreement and the disagreement. Then when you both parties need to prioritize the areas of the conflict, and then develop a plan to work on those areas and make sure you follow through on the plan. Um, again, it's good to have a third person or outside person with a non-bias because that creates accountability and you follow through and then you come out with a successful solution and your conflict is resolved. Does anybody have any questions about that? I did not spend as much time just going over the conflict because, like I said, all the techniques that we talked about apply to stress and conflict, but I did want to definitely point out that you have to be an active listener when you're dealing with conflict. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I, um, we went over all of your top things for managing stress and conflict. Um, one of the other things that I did not talk about, which I can send out a link to when I send out an email after the webinar is you can also make a stress relief kit or box some people refer to and that's simply where you have a box set aside already pre-made where if you're having a really bad day there's some things to lighten the load there's so many different ways to do that um, there's no right or wrong way some people put um, a scented candle in there essential oils um, dark chocolate, it's been proven medically. If you eat dark chocolate, it releases hormones that uplift your spirits. Um, if you want to put a stress reliever ball, um, if you have one like to write, um, they suggest, medical people suggest you put a clicky pen because there's something about the clicking pen where you click that noise that is sometimes calming, so it's sort of like white noise. So you can put one of those in a box, put a writing pad if you like to write, coloring books if you like to draw. It's all kinds of things, so you definitely can put that in. At this time, I would like to answer any questions or any concerns or anything you just want to comment about. I see some people said a 
stress kit, a stress box is an awesome idea. And like I say, when you did it, you can put it away. You can put it in a, a shoe box or whatever box I have a big, decorate it with pretty paper. What I've done is I've made some for my daughters. So when they have a hard day at school, I give it to them. And then I have them make one for me. So it works both ways. Is you can get some of your friends or family members and y'all can make them for each other. See, people like the stress box idea. I'll definitely send out um, an idea that's what we talked about. So that way you'll have it for your reference. And then also with the Girl Scout treat, that's an excellent idea for craft for the girls to make, especially now for the time we live. That's something we could do virtually to lift each other up and then they could send it to one another or they have to keep it for themselves. Do we have any questions about anything, any points that we went over? Anybody need me to review anything while I still have you on the line? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I take it that now we are all prepared to fully handle our stressful or crazy unexpected days. I just want to remind you that yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, so laugh and forget about today, and I promise you when you do those things, you're going to feel a whole lot better. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. You have a wonderful evening. Have a great day. Bye-bye.